I've been working on this project with Jöran for the past year. And this paper that we're presenting uh, is drawing on some perspectives and findings from this ongoing research project, which is focused on technology-based musical practices among Norwegian musicians, composers, and sound artists. I think that despite the rather Norwegian focus, uh, I think the contents of it can be applied widely. After presenting some theory first, I'll move on to discussing some of these theoretical perspectives with reference to statements made by various composers and sound artists that we interviewed last year. In a sense, creative practice has historically been defined in relation to a given medium. And this has also been the case with technology-based music and art. Today, many of these music technologies are so fully intertwined with practice that we no longer consider them to be technologies. When it became possible to record sounds, remove them from their context, repeat them, multiply them, reverse them, change their speed, and chop the sounds into smaller pieces, this opened up a groundbreaking set of possibilities to manipulate the materials of sounds themselves without the uses of formalized and abstract notation systems for human performance. More and more methods were developed to treat sounds in this fashion, along with the ability to move sounds around the room from loudspeaker to loudspeakers. All of these practices and experiments led to new ways of listening to sounds, where they're separated from their origins, that is, an acousmatic listening. And I'm sure you all know the people that are listed in these, that are kind of displayed in these photographs. As computers were used in small numbers in the 1950s and through the innovations of the 80s and the 90s, when computers became fast enough and cheap enough, its uses have permeated all aspects of music production and fundamentally changed all creative processes. The consequences of these developments are the topics we are dealing with. Not because the consequences are negative or problematic in any way, but because it has fundamentally changed more or less everything it has touched. Electronic music technologies are now in the hands of a record number of people. And this proliferation has given rise to new socialities around music where new sonic genres readily mix with other types of media content. Tradition-bound hierarchies of gatekeepers are of less importance than previously. And several of these new genres have achieved institutional acceptance and inclusion in museums and festivals. Some practitioners deliberately maintain their independence uh, and remain rebelliously close to what we can loosely refer to as a quote unquote new folk music which is developed outside of institutionalized funding structures and in informal contexts such as artist run galleries, maker spaces or club stages. It was pointed out by my colleague Jaren Rudi in 2015 that there's been a shift in technologically based creative practices, which in contrast to the historical electroacoustic music tendencies, the artistic value of recent technology-based music is not necessarily determined by experts, effectively blurring the lines between composer, audience, composition, mediation, and performance. As a methodological perspective to understand these new developments, the term post acousmatic has been introduced. And by calling these practices, quote unquote, new, we are referring to practices that spring out of but they do not necessarily belong to the traditional acousmatic, electronic, or electroacoustic music uh, traditions. The post-acousmatic is used as a methodological perspective to examine technology-based practices and is not an attempt at defining a new genre category, but is one perspective that affords us a way to describe the artistic pluralisms that are not demarcated by genres or terminologies. In classic acousmatic music, the focus is mainly on changes in spectra and sound pressures without much thought to the context or the sound source. Within the post-acousmatic, this perspective is greatly expanded. It cannot purely be perceived within a spectromorphological perspective. However, for many practitioners, the term post-acousmatic will not be found relevant as they have never been involved in the traditions of acousmatic music and have no relationship to these traditions. The large diversity in artistic aims and practices in technology-based music found today makes it impossible to discuss technology music, technology and music and art within the confines and histories and traditions of acousmatic music. 
These concerns can also be traced back to Rosalind Krauss' discussions of sculpture in the 1970s through her concept of the expanded field. Sculpture here steps away from its basis in the object and moves into land art, into architecture and multiplicities of other fields. This was what made her to make the statement, practice is not defined in relation to a given medium, sculpture, but rather in relation to the logical operations on a set of cultural terms for which any medium, photography, books, lines on walls, mirrors or sculpture itself might be used. Krauss was not concerned with or could really discuss neither computer technologies nor music or sound, although sound was becoming a popular medium for many artists working in the 1960s. Rather, the importance in continuing to discuss her notions of the expanded field is that it gives us a prism to see the continuing growth of genres beyond their defined uh, categorical demarcations. This expanding field of practice does not merely refer to its own materials or technologies as discussed by Simon Waters in the 2000 book chapter Beyond the Acousmatic, but it extends the music, its existence, and it adds social perspectives. This expansion and turn towards an extended sociality is evident in many artists' selections of sound materials, their processing and interactions with them, or the presentation and context that extend their meanings. The essential finding is that new technology-based practices find their meaning in broader contexts that involve composers, musicians, and audiences beyond traditional listening. And that conceptualism plays an important part when moving the music away from a focus on medium and material. These wider engagements with technology-based music can bring it closer into discourse with decolonial, feminist, ecological, and socially aware practices, where the canon is increasingly question and critique. Some of these concerns surrounding the turn towards conceptualism has already been explored in the visual arts. And Seth Kim Cohen extrapolates that conceptual art with a capital C is often said to refer to art practices beginning in the late 1960s to 70s that concern themselves principally with ideas rather than images or objects. The story goes that artists turned away from material concerns, including paradigmatically the mediality of Greenbergian abstract painting and concerned themselves with the language that motivated, engaged, described, and resulted in works of art. To some, the conceptual turn of the visual arts echoes the linguistic turn in philosophy. This analysis of the historical conditions surrounding conceptual art is mirrored in the Krauss quote from, that I just uh, read out, where the operations performed in a work of art, music or sonnets, is not solely dependent on the materials of its own making, but rather on a broader set of cultural terms. So what then about technology and the uses of technology? In this research project, that is the basis of this project, or this paper, sorry, we have interviewed 23 composers, musicians, and artists who work with sound within what we loosely define as technology-dependent music. That is, music which could not have existed without the technologies used for its creation. And this does almost always refer to electronic technologies. This is of course so because many of the other technologies we use such as stave notation, scores, musical instruments, pen, paper, concert halls, etc., are all technologies. But their use is so fully integrated that we no longer consider them to be technologies. Many of the artists we've interviewed tone down the technological dependence and focus in the developments of their works and generally state that the visible nature of the technology is not, not of any importance. Yet the technologies they employ is a strong driving force in both finding and presenting their expressions. One such direction can be traced from the improvisation quartet Lemur, who play, all play acoustic instruments, yet to transgress these boundaries frequently in their compositional efforts. In the example here, the piece Critical Band from 2012 is realized as a site-specific composition which is based on a long series of acoustic measurements of the buildings the piece is so, supposed to be performed in. The piece was made in, collection with, uh, in collaboration with Arab Acoustics in New York, where the ensemble spent a week working in their labs to develop a system for uh, acoustical analysis. The realization of the piece is deeply embedded in complex technological processes, but then in turn, the performance of the piece contains no technologies apart from the acoustic instruments used during the performance. 
On the right hand side around the corner, you can see what is called a position score, which is where the performers are to be placed and then to move throughout the score, effectively playing a certain pitch stretch to activate the room modes of the place, of the place they're in. So it's site specific in the sense that it directly exploits the acoustics of the space into the music that they play. However, there's also a prevalent skepticism among artists who use technology to make art. One of our interviewees, a French Moroccan artist, states that, quote, in music technology, there is a lot of technology enthusiasts, but I would like to see more of a resistance to technology sometimes. By solely focusing on the technology and its uses, we lose an opportunity to talk about ethics and specifically in relation to technology, end quote. Yet another informant, a composer and sound artist who has become renowned for her acousmatic multi-channel compositions, voiced a clear skepticism of ambisonics as a format for composition. It took some time for me, quote, to begin to use ambisonics because all the ambisonic pieces I heard were more or less a showcase of technology with sounds flying around and moving fast. That can be exciting, but doesn't really give me anything, end quote. Likewise, a Swedish Nor Norway based composer states that technology gives us many opportunities which we exploit. And naturally, it sets premises for what you do and what you can do, but not for what you want to do. I have become very skeptical of technology, and it does not have the same appeal to me as it once did. I am not as fascinated in it. End quote. And then, yet another one of our informants is very merciless and say, quote, A lot appear more as technology fetishism than art and music. I can see the appeal. It's fun to play with Legos. It's fun to program many months on end. But if you're actually attempting to produce art, one should have the art as a perspective." End quote. These comments from four of our interviewees display a clear skepticism for the uses of technology and the way it is and can be integrated into art production. This is also a concern which refers back to the perspectives voiced by Simon Waters previously of a music being obsessed with its own materials and the processes of its own making. But of course, not everything is completely dire in this sense. We have seen many exceptional examples of artists using technologies as a means to realize ideas, explore social, economic, ecological, and systemic questions. These practices point to some of the concerns addressed through the post acousmatic where many artists and composers transgress genre boundaries, which again causes many of these genre demarcations to be more and more invisible and inconsequential. Perhaps the term media art could be a more apt description for these practices. One such example uh, we see in the work of installation and sound artist Signali Den, who on the one side works with small resonating stones wrapped in copper wire, and in yet another piece, as the one that is displayed here from 2019, she created a 28 meter long microphone membrane in order to tune into the tidal zone around the village of Rambag in Lufu. This piece addresses many questions around place and what it means to be in and occupy a place, specifically the rhythms around the intertidal zone. Um, she uses a, um, I'm not entirely sure the kind of the amplification technology she uses, but she's created this like large, uh, membrane that is also at high tide is partially covered by water and at low tide is kind of excited by the wind. This extinguishing of kind of genre demarcations that I've mentioned earlier is reflected in statements by two musicians who work in Trondheim who organize a series of concerts called Club Kanin or Club Rabbit. They state that one of their primary aims for organizing these concerts is to tie together people working in different genres and people who belong to different subcultures. And by that, I mean, quote, you have art students who make small soundscapes based on their artistic outlooks, outlooks. black metal people who disappear into dark ambience and who make dark soundscape, noise people who make noise, electronica people who both make rhythmic music, but also extend into much more experimental approaches. Their stated aim is to try to bring together all these different genres and subcultures in order to create new music and to create new kind of socialities where they can meet around the music and then transgress their own boundaries. 
these are just a few examples of some of the interviews that we've conducted. And some of these discussions could go on for many hours. We do see that there is a deep integration of electronic tools and technologies and it places parts of this development uh, in a new light. We see there is a technologization as a new element along with personal experiences. And this transcends the more mathematical and engineering approaches that have been common earlier in this history. We see this perhaps most clearly among composers working in 3D audio, where they display a good understanding of acoustics and psychoacoustics about how sound behave and how we as humans perceive it. But most of all, this technologization is not just an example of and a perspective on music or sound itself. Rather, it is dependent on reflections and experiences from broader fields of the arts. And these perspectives are the basis of the works uh, or are the basis for works which explore political, social, cultural, and environmental concerns. The field of technology-based music has expanded and these technologies have facilitated a space for creation where a multitude of various engagements with sound and music are possible, drawing on several different music and art traditions. This shift away from the Western, modernist, and typical conventions of acousmatic or computer music is, urges us to approach technology more as a contextually situated resource and it opens new avenues for critique and creation. And again, for those of you who are attending ICMC next month in Limerick, we will be presenting a paper entitled Computing Music and post acousmatic Practices, where we're discussing these questions in light of computing music's history and future.